All right. Hey guys, how's it going? Welcome to my um, Dogs vs. Warriors Round 4 review. Uh, obviously, I wanted to do one of these for Round 2 and 3, but uh, I was busy. So, with the Round 2 one, obviously, I watched the game. And um, the Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, where I'd normally record, like where I would record the video, I was uh, working non-stop because uh, that weekend, so not this weekend, but the weekend before, I was um, going away for an Oztag State Cup which, you know, I posted a little short video on, some of you might have seen it. So that's why I didn't do the round two one, and then the round three one I didn't do, obviously, because I was up in Coffs Harbour, so I couldn't record it. So that's why I didn't do round two and three, but we're back for round four. Um, just my quick thoughts on round two and three, because obviously I did watch both the games. Um, I thought we were really good. <clears throat> um, obviously, a few things to work on, one of which... Well, actually, two of which we will talk about in this video specifically because I think it is quite important and it has to do with the Warriors game and why I think we lost. But, um, yeah, overall, I think we played really well. Um, Flanagan and Birdo were finally linking up, you know, as a first and second receiver partnership. They weren't just split your left and right side. You know, they were actually working together to create, spa like to create space, to create opportunities, and that's why we were able to score so many points against the Storm and Tigers. <clears throat> so, um, focus. Yep, there we go. Yep. So yeah, just um, round two and three, I think we played really well, and then something we'll talk about a little bit later is something that I would have mentioned in those videos. All right, so um, round four versus Warriors, uh, where to start? Um, overall, I think just as a generic fan, like if you weren't supporting, I think it was a really good game in patches. All right, and so the first thing I want to talk about Right, I'll avoid talking about the team specifically for now, but yeah, the first thing I want to talk about is the refereeing. All right, the refereeing in this game, both ways for the Bulldogs and the Warriors, was terrible. It was horrible. Like neither team could build momentum and play off the back of it because the referee was whistle happy. Right, it's as simple as that. Like there were so many penalties for like offside, inside the 10, you know, whatever it was, where if you'd go back and watch it, they were maybe half a step offside, you know, just like let it go, let the momentum build. Like that's when both teams were scoring their points, you know, Bulldogs scored both of their points when they, you know, there was no penalties, no stoppages in play, stuff like that. They were able to build the momentum and score. And then the Warriors did the exact same thing when they scored. All right. So when the referee put his whistle away, it was fantastic, but the, the referee was far too whistle-happy in that game. And then, obviously, there were a couple of decisions from the bunker that probably weren't the best, <laughs> if we're honest. All right. And, I you know, I obviously look at, you know, the Bulldogs, like, you know, post-game, stuff like that, you know, see what people say and all that sort of stuff. And, um, you know, obviously, the Reed Marnie, um, the Shepherd or the Obstruction, whatever you want to call it, in my opinion, yes, it was an obstruction. All right, because and the reason I say yes, it was an obstruction is not because I'm a Bulldogs fan and I'm salty or anything like that. Because I'll talk about something else in a second. All right, but it's because I think it was Fanua Blake was the one that ran the block line. The problem is Fanua Blake started in front of Sean Johnson. All right, so by the time Sean Johnson had stepped to like take on that space, Fanua Blake was already in front of him. So that like you know. By the laws of the game, that is an obstruction, right? Now, I'm not saying that's the reason the Bulldogs lost or anything like that because, you know, Bulldogs had ample opportunity to score points that we fucked up that we'll talk about later. So I'm not saying that's the reason. And then on top of that, right, the Bulldogs scored a try that realistically we shouldn't have got either, right? The Addo Car try, obviously ours was off a of scrum, so you had to work a play off the scrum to get Addo Car away down the sideline. But, you know... The bunker absolutely fumbled the bag with that one. You know, like, off one replay, they're like, nah, it wasn't a strip, it's sweet. But then they go to another replay from behind, and you can see kick out clearly puts his hand on the ball and reefs it out. Like, absolutely horrendous officiating across the board, both bunker and on-field referee. It killed the game. It killed all the momentum in the game, especially in that second half. It killed all the momentum in that game and made it such a boring watch, which was so unfortunate. Uh, but yeah, other than that, um, <clears throat> yeah, the referees, I think, are the reason that game wasn't as good as it could have been. Like, you know, both teams in form, both teams really strong offensively. And just, yeah, neither team could really build any sort of momentum because the referees were just 
stop and start the game, and then obviously the bunker fumbles on both the on both the Sean Johnson try and the Addo Car try. Right, so realistically, Warriors, I believe, would have won anyway. Because, um, yeah, like obviously, if both tries are taken away, then you know, Warriors still win by two. So Warriors still would have won the game regardless. But yeah, both of those decisions just fucking terrible, absolutely horrible. All right. So now with that out of the way, let's um, get on to the Bulldogs specifically. Obviously, that's you know my team. That's why I'm here. All right. So I'll start with the positives. I've just got sort of like a little list here of stuff that I liked throughout the game and stuff like that. And then we'll talk about things I'm not too happy about as well. All right. <clears throat> so the things that I'm you know, happy about, I guess. Um, all right. So the, f- the first thing I've got written down here is the young, the young lad, Preston. He has been fantastic. He's been a breath of fresh air, honestly. It's going to be really difficult when, you know, the likes of Tavita Pangai Jr. come back and, you know, like we've got a few other people coming back, like, What's going to happen to him? Right, and then on top of that, we've got like young players like Torpenny in the resis and stuff like that that deserve their shot as well. But, you know, Preston's playing at such a level at the moment that I just I don't think you can drop him. Like, you just can't. He's playing fantastic. He's been incredible so far at the start of this season. You can see just the way he runs, the way he plays, just the passion that he plays with, the enthusiasm that he plays with, the aggression that he plays with. It's something that we've been lacking in a forward for a long time. And he's got it, and it's fantastic. All right, a few other things. Our centers. All right, I'll start with Alamotti. Um, he's really starting to find his feet this year. Uh, he will be a superstar for years to come, in my opinion. Um, you know, once he sort of really like properly finds his not his level, like his le- level is not the right word for it, but you know, once he really finds his play style and like the way to work with Kickow, Burton, and Addo Car on his outside, once he can really master that. Oh man, he he's gonna be an absolute freak at what nineteen and he yeah he he's gonna be an absolute menace for years to come. Uh, and then on the other side, Avarillo. Um, obviously in my round one video, I said that I would like Avarillo back at fullback, but that's something I'll talk about a little bit later because I will talk about um Hayes Perham. Um, I think Avarillo's really found his place at center. You know, get him a little bit of early ball, let him work his magic. Like, you know, he's quick, he's agile, he's surprisingly strong. Like that first try where he just shoved off whoever the center was he was up against. I don't know who it was off top head. But the way he just straight up just shoved them off and then, you know, flicked past it to Kiraz for the try. Like, that's the sort of stuff he can do. So we need to be giving him more early ball instead of just, again, something I'll talk about later, focusing on the left side. Like our right side is fantastic. You've got Avarillo out there creating chances and then you've got Kiraz who I think, I don't think it would be any more, but prior to this round, he was leading the Dally M. Like, you know, what was it? Most run meters out of anyone in the competition, most offloads, most line breaks, I think, as well. He's absolutely killing it. So, you know, again, it's something we'll talk about, I'll talk about a bit later, but yeah, like our right side combination with Avarillo, <clears throat> yeah, Preston, Avarillo, and um, Kiraz is it can be deadly if we take the time to really, like, you know, bring it together and use it a bit more often. Like, we have weapons across the board, genuinely. All right. And then um, Hayes Perham, uh, he's definitely improved in my eyes. I think in attack, he's still finding his way a little bit. Like, there are times where you could see he should be, like, sweeping out the back or something, and he's just not there. Not every time, but there are some times where he's still not there. So, um... <clears throat> Oh, excuse me. If he can clean that up, he'll be a great fullback for us for the next, for, you know, for the next couple of years. Because obviously, obviously, Critters coming in next year, I don't think he'll play fullback next year. I mean, he might. I don't know. I don't want him a fullback, but that's a, you know, that's another video, that's another story. But um, yeah, at least for this year, Param has the ability to be a very good fullback for us if he can sort of clean up that attacking, support, running, sweeping out the back sort of stuff. Right, and then the last sort of positive for me is um, Max King. He's an absolute freak. Um, you know, an eight. You know, he can essentially play eighty minutes as a prop, like as a front rower. That's amazing. It's incredible, and it's not. And it's not only the case that he can play eighty minutes. It's he can play eighty minutes and still, like you know, carry, if that makes sense, right? Like you know, most forward, you know, most props, you'll get half an hour out of them. They'll be off for twenty thirty, and then they'll come back on for the final thirty, right? Because they need that break to sort of re-energize and go again, like. Max King just doesn't stop. 
right? Like he'll just run, 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 tackle, tackle, tackle. Like he just he doesn't stop. He's amazing, and he's he's probably the best forward we've had at the club for a long time. Like front rower, I should say specifically. He's probably the best prop we've had for a long time. I can't remember the last time we had a prop that is doing the stuff he's doing. And it's fantastic to see. Alright. Yeah, that's all the positives. So now we'll just um talk about a few things that I'm not a massive fan of. Alright. <clears throat> There's only a couple this time. All right. And the first one is kick out. Now look, with the skill set that Kikau has, the skill set, the size, the speed, the strength, he should be the best second rower in the competition. All right, and that's not me just saying it because he's at the Bulldogs. Right? I said it last year when he was at Penrith, but he tries way too hard to be a ball player. Like there was um there was a play in in the Warriors in that game just say the Warriors game where all he had to do was catch it, you know, Take on the line, you know, he's going to make a half line break, probably get his arm free for an offload, but what's he do? He catches it, runs a couple meters, and tries to ball play and throws it behind everyone, and the play dies, right? Like, we need we need kick out just hitting holes, hitting them hard, because he can hit those holes, get his arm free, pop an offload, whatever, right? And then if he does that a couple times, then the defense has to engage in him. That's when we can hit out the back and get those two-on-ones out wide, but... Yeah, for some reason, Kiko just wants to be a ball player. I don't know if it's how he's being coached. I don't know if that's what Serraldo wants him doing. I don't know if that's just him doing it himself. But it's something that needs to be fixed because if it doesn't get fixed, then our left side is going to continue to struggle because um, the ball's just going to get to kick out and everything just shuts down. Because instead of hitting those holes, he tries to ball play or whatever he tries to do and it just shuts down everything. All right? That's it. Kick out yeah, needs needs to be more of a second rower as opposed to an attempted playmaker. I think he wants to play thirteen. <laughs> like the way he the way he plays, the way he like runs and stuff like it seems like he wants to be a thirteen. It seems like he wants to be a lock. He wants to be a ball playing forward, which we don't need at second row. It's as simple as that. We don't need it. All right. And then um, the next thing I want to talk about again, I talked about him in the round one uh, video. Flanagan, Kyle Flanagan. <clears throat> um, I'll probably try and screen cap a couple of comments from people saying they're like, oh, you know, Flanagan's no good, this and the other thing. When in reality, I think in this game, especially the Warriors game, he was the better half between him and Burton. I just, I hate how as soon as something goes wrong, it's, oh, Flanagan's the issue, Flanagan's the issue, Flanagan's the issue. When, you know, like Burton could fuck up big time. No one will say a word about it because Burton's meant to be the new golden child of the dogs, right? Now, look, do I think Flanagan is a world-class halfback? No, absolutely not. He's not a world-class halfback, but he's good. He's not terrible, right? He's good. And the games against um, Storm and Tiger showed it. When Flanagan was able to, like, sweep out to the left, get into the first receiver role, you know, and link up with Burton, that's where we scored a lot of our points in those two games against the you know, and made line break stuff like against Storm and Tigers because Flanagan was able to move and link up with his halves partner. And at the start of the game with the Warriors, he was doing that as well. Like, he was getting the ball early, either linking up with Burden or on his right side, he'd get the ball early. He'd take it on. Like, you know, obviously he was a part of the first try for <clears throat> for um, Kiraz, right? Flanagan was the first receiver. I think it was Preston ran the block line. Flanagan held it up perfectly, hit Avarillo, so he was one-on-one -on -one with his man. Avarillo obviously beat his man, played the flick past the Kiraz. And then later on in the game, there was another one where Flanagan got the ball, the first receiver, bounced back to the short side, and we created another, you know, another short side raid where um, I think I think we made like a half line break or a line break or something, and then we got tackled. I can't remember exactly what happened off the end of it. But like, the talent is there for Flanagan. The problem is there's just no, no one seems to have any faith in him and it must be absolutely killing his confidence, All right? Like, don't get me wrong, Burton, fantastic player, All right? He will be, you know, he'll be a future Origin star, future Origin, sorry, future Origin player, you know, future Australia player, like, you know, he will be a superstar. But just because he will be a superstar doesn't mean he currently is, All right? So we need to put more faith in Flanagan as a club 
to help direct and lead and control us. Like, obviously, Marnie's doing a great job controlling our forwards, giving Burton and Flanagan a bit more time and space to do what they can on their edges. But we need our halves linking up. Whether that means Kyle goes to the left, Burton goes to the right to play first receiver to get each other out, out a bit wider for a bit more shape, Whatever it is, it's something that has to get done because that's when we've looked our most deadly when our halves are linking up and working together. All right? This whole left side split, right side split, it's just stupid. I don't understand why we do it. Like, you know, you look at the top teams, you know, Penrith, you get Cleary linking up with Luai. All right? Sharks, you get Nico Hines linking up with Moylan. All right? Um, Rabbitohs. Uh, what's his name? Ilias with Walker. All right? Roosters, Walker with Kiri, like all the top teams, the halves link up with each other. They don't just sit left and right side. They work together, they link together, and they pass to each other and play off the back of each other, all right? And that's what we need to do at the dogs, all right? So, no, Flanagan is not to blame for this loss. So, people saying that he is and that Burton would be so much better with a different halfback, rah, 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 rah. It's like, well, no, Burton had two, three different halfbacks last year and he did the exact same thing he's doing this year. So, no, it's not the halfback. That's the issue. The issue is the system and the structure that we're playing is that for some reason we've got each other split on the left and right instead of having our halves linking up and playing together. All right, so if we can fix that, it'll make Burton look a lot better. It'll make Flano look a lot better. So, yeah, please just stop blaming Flanagan. No, he's not a superstar. No, he's not a world-class halfback, but he's not a bad playmaker. He's not a bad halfback. All right, he created more chances against the Warriors than Burton did. No one's going to mention that. No one's going to say anything about that because we lose. Oh, it's Flanagan's fault. We need a halfback. All right, it's just it's just stupid and it's just frustrating to see because there's a player there in Flanagan, and he's just not given. He's just not being given the opportunity to show it. Unfortunately, whether that be through the club or through the fans, just you know, hurling abuse and talking smack about him, which is just unfortunate to see. All right. And then the last thing I want to talk about is um, Seraldo. Now, I think Seraldo has done a great job with the team so far, but one thing he's really, really screwing us with is interchanges. All right? So far this season, I, I went and looked it up. I'd have to double check it, but I went and looked it up. I'm pretty sure so far this season, as a team, we have not scored a try past, I think it's like the 49th minute or the 50 something minute. Right, you know, the final 25 minutes of a game, we have not scored, and that's where we've conceded majority of our points. Like, you know, against Storm and Tigers, that final 25 minutes is where they got us. Like, because for some reason, Seraldo is just using our interchanges in such a dumb way, in such a weird way. Like, I know I said Max King before can play, in eight, can play 80 minutes. Just because he can play it doesn't mean he should. Right, like, if you give Max King 20 minutes off, so that he can come back on and cause a ruckus again for that final 30. Like, that's a game changer for us. That's a that's a difference maker, right? I think two weeks in a row now, um, Serraldo's left a player on the bench unused, which I think is just pointless. And then this week against the Warriors, I think all of our bench players only got maybe 15, 20 minutes. Like, it's just not enough. You know, they're there to be a fresh pair of legs to keep the momentum rolling, to keep us going. And Seraldo's just not using... I don't know if it's a tactic he's trying out. I don't know if it's just he doesn't trust them. I don't know what it is. But something needs to be done about it because if our... Um, you know, if our um, if our interchanges keeps being poor, then it will get to a point where we start getting smacked, right? Like, I'll use the Storm game as an example. If that's a full... You know, if that's a... Um, what's the word? I can't think of the word. But, you know, if Storm had all their players, then we get smoked in that final 25 minutes. Like, if, if they had Munster, we are, we're gone. We're smoked, right? Like, we, we can stick with any team for 50 minutes, 55, 60 minutes. But then that final 20 to 30, however long it is, we just, we die in the ass because we aren't using our interchanges properly, right? And that's what happened against the Storm. It's what happened against Tigers. And it's what happened against the Warriors. You could see in that final 15, 20 minutes, like, we had a good chunk of ball on the Warriors' line, and we just couldn't do anything with it because our players were too tired. Like, it got to a point where all we were doing was just crash play, crash play, crash play, because our players were too tired to think of doing anything else. 
All right, so yeah, interchange is a big thing right now for us. If Serraldo can sort that out properly, like, yeah, again, I don't know if it's because he doesn't trust the people on the bench or if it's a system he's trying to work in, you know, whatever it is, it's something that needs to be worked. It's something that needs to be addressed and something that needs to be fixed because, you know, like this week, it cost us a game. Like, we, you know, no offense to the Warriors because they played really well, but we should have put them away very easily. We should have, but we didn't. And that's because our players just got tired and the subs weren't done properly. All right. But, um, yeah, that's my um, Bulldogs Warriors review. Um, again, hopefully I'll try to get one of these done each week for each game. But, you know, we'll just have to see. Life is busy. All right. But, um, yeah, let me know what you thought of the game. If you agree with anything I've said. If you disagree, let me know why. All right. Um, hopefully I should have another outfield video out in the next couple days, hopefully. Um, but yeah, with that one said, guys, thanks for watching. Take it easy. And yeah, have a good one.